I want to talk to you today about real contradictions in the King James Bible. Stick with me on this one. You get this thing, you know, get in with these atheists and whatever else, and you say, well, the Bible says, and they say, oh, that King James Bible, it's full of errors. It's full of contradictions. It's got so many problems with it. You say, oh, like what? Well, you see, back in the Old Testament, there was one example where a guy had so many chariots, and another guy had another number of chariots. There's a contradiction right there. And there's one, that, this guy was so many years old when he began to reign. This one's so many years old when he began to reign. The two different situations there and whatever else. And uh, see, it's contradictions. Contradictions. There's all kinds of contradictions. Well, um, if you actually looked at the things scientifically, you could say, well, maybe it's two different writers. Maybe they one heard a number and the other heard a different number. Or the first guy got the wrong number and the second one corrected it. I mean, you wouldn't allow us to subject your scientific textbooks to the same criticism. Uh, years ago, they said it was two, the universe was two point something billion years old, now 4.6 and 4.5 for a little while, and then they'll probably change that. Um, you know, all throughout the, uh, you know, 2020 to 2023, there was constant conflictions, you know, within the, the uh, scientific world saying that you should, and then there was others that said you shouldn't, you know. And we have data on this, we have data on that. I mean, when I studied this whole thing of the contradictions, the errors in the King James Bible, almost all of them I thought, I never even saw that before. I mean, you literally have to go through and, you know, look for problems in the King James Bible to prove some of these things. And here's the truth of the matter. Those contradictions, supposed contradictions, have already been answered back years ago, right there in this book. So, oh, well, you know, you can't answer it. It's already been answered, you know, and there's, I mean, there's a tax on me. Uh, I'm not the word of God. I'm not perfect like the King James Bible, but there's even a tax on me that I've already answered. I've said, yeah, I, I made a mistake. I said this, or I said that, and the attacks are still out there. Oh, you know, he's, Denlinger's such a, stu a stupid idiot and everything. He, he says this, he believes that. I've come out and I've corrected it. <laughs> so the people that, believe that there are errors in the King James Bible. Um, it's a philosophical problem. It's not an actual real true problem. And when you answer their supposed contradictions, they'll just try to find more fault with the Word of God because the Word of God calls them sinners and says that they're going to go to hell, and they don't like that. So they try to attack the book and tear it down. But you see, if you had a little bit more brains out there in the atheistic community, there's not a whole lot of brains in that whole realm there, just conformity to different systems that try to attack God. That's all atheism is. But if you had a little bit more brains, you'd actually find real contradictions in the King James Bible. But as we'll go through this study, I will show you these real contradictions, but then I'll give you the solution at the end. Okay? So let's look at some real contradictions. Okay? And again, Oh, hey, you know, this guy said that there was this many chariots, and this one says that there's that many chariots, and it's two different numbers. There could be confusion between the two different guys, and God lets the confusion in there just to show their man, and every man at his best state is altogether vanity. See, where you want to find the contradictions is doctrinal errors, where there's doctrinal problems, where the Bible contradicts itself. Then you have something, because then you can say it's not a rule to a guide to live by. I mean, you know, uh, I guess some of these atheists are dumb enough to think if there's a word that's been misprinted or something, you know, I'll see some of that. Although in the 1611 edition, like this one up here, uh, there was a, a couple spelling issues and whatever, so it can't be God's perfect word. Uh, no, you look at how they were printing those things back then, uh, putting the typeset in by hand and, you know, basically backwards and things, you know, to get the paper to come down and they, they print the thing. And I mean, it's amazing that they got it even legible, you know, it'd be very tedious putting all the letters in there like that with the original printing presses back in 1611. Um, so I'm going to show you some real ones today that are contradictions in the King James Bible. And I love the book and I dedicated my life to the book so please stay with me. Uh, you'll see what I have to say. Uh, many of you will figure it out right away. I actually did an old study on this um, many years ago, back in uh, December the 6th of 2009, right there it is, I'll show you the, the uh, title of it later on, 
but uh, it's not on YouTube anymore. I think it might actually be on the, another channel. I think it's there yet, but Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. These twelve that Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Did Jesus tell his disciples to go to the Gentiles? No. Where did he say to go? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay. Keep your hand right there in Matthew chapter 10 and go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And I will show you that there's a terrible contradiction here. And um, lost people get choked up on this one. Okay. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 6. Uh, don't go to the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. The uncircumcision, in other words. Wait a second. The words of Jesus back here in Matthew chapter 10 say, don't go to the Gentiles. But over here in Galatians, Paul says, I was sent to the Gentiles. And Jesus is the one that sent him. Oh, 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 what do we do? What do we do with this? Because Jesus, we should probably call him Yeshua, maybe Yahashua or Yahawashi or some other kind of name. He said not to go to the Gentiles, but Paul went to the Gentiles. Hmm. The Apostle Paul must be a false prophet. There's the solution. And we shouldn't go to the Gentiles. And yet the funny thing is, most people that say that are Gentiles. <laughs> it's kind of an issue. Um, hmm. So then that would mean today, if the words of Jesus are correct and to be interpreted in the context where they show up there, that means that no Gentiles could be saved. And that his disciples should be, you know, should have gone to the Jews and then it comes down through the Jews, you know, till today. And only Jews can be saved. I mean, is that a contradiction? If you just take those two portions of Scripture and don't look at anything else, would that be a contradiction? Yes, it would be. But there's a key to understanding it. If you're newly saved, you can get tripped up on some of this stuff. You will literally get the people, try to get you back under the law, which is what the whole book of Galatians is about, and they'll say, I, I'm a red-letter Christian. I only listen to what Jesus wrote, and Paul's a false prophet. Uh, no, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. We'll get back to that. Giving my sermon away here. Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24. I'll show you another contradiction. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Stand in the holy place, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Hmm. First Corinthians, keep your hand there in Matthew chapter 24. Go to First Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. And, and believe me, if you're out there and you're newly saved or you haven't ever heard of dispensational teaching, you need to watch this study because if you don't get this thing figured out, you will get messed up by false prophets. They will come and they will wreck you by showing you some of these contradictions. And they won't do it the way I'm doing. You see, they'll only show you one side. They won't show you both sides. Uh, and if they do, they'll, they'll try to pull you over to one way or the other. Uh, see, both statements are actually correct. All these uh, contradictions that I'm going to show you, they're all correct. But you have to rightly divide. Very important. Matthew 24, verse 15. The abomination of Daniel, or the... Abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the, the prophet. Stand in the holy place. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple is in Jerusalem? Yeah. No, it doesn't say that. It says, which temple ye are. 
wait a second. Okay, this doesn't make any sense again. How can we see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place when our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Huh. And I get these dumb bunny posties and they'll, they'll come out post-tribbers to believe that they go through the time of Jacob's trouble because the church needs to be purified more. No, it doesn't. Uh, and they'll come out and they'll say, um, you know, Matthew chapter 24 is for Christians. It's the body of Christ. Well, that's kind of a problem because Jesus didn't die on the cross until chapter 28. So doctrinally, the New Testament comes in with the death of the testator. See Hebrews chapter 9 on that. Um, so doctrinally, it would be Old Testament, Matthew chapter 24. If you go back to verse 16 of Matthew chapter 24, and look, it says, that let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Um, now, there could be some Christians in Judea, but uh, I think that's kind of where the Jews are supposed to be. Okay, <laughs> I'm not in Judea right now. I wouldn't mind fleeing into the mountains. I, I like to flee into the mountains. You know, it's a good place to be. Uh, I live in the mountains. But uh, in the time of Jacob's trouble, what are Christians doing in Judea? And what are they doing looking at the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place when their body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Why do Christians need to have a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem to look towards? Think about it. Oh, but, but that's a contradiction. Well, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, yes, it is a contradiction. But if you're born again and the Holy Spirit leads you, it's not a contradiction. Both statements are correct. Go back to Matthew chapter 24 and go down to verse 20. Here's a good one. All you Seventh-day Adventists, get ready to lay, leave nasty comments towards me. Call me a false prophet. Whatever you want, get ready. Ready? Ready? Get your fingers ready to go. Poise them above the keyboard or your little phone or whatever else you do. Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Praise hallelujah. We get to the Sabbath day. We're supposed to be keeping the Sabbath day. And Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. Oh, Sunday worship's evil. It's terrible. It's false. It's fake. It's a... Come up with a, by a, a forced vegetarian woman, <laughs> founder of the Seventh-day Adventist, you know, cult satanic cult so satanic we believe a lot of the same no you don't no you don't you're in a satanic cult if you're part of the seventh day adventist nonsense all right well, but it says keep the sabbath right pray that you're neither on the sabbath day right there in the new testament it's not the new testament it's the old testament the new testament begins with the death of the testator it's not for us today uh, the Sabbath day was given as a sign for the Jewish people. I have a whole big detailed study going through all the scriptures, and I still get Seventh-day Adventists calling me a liar and a deceiver. You don't know what you're talking about, Denlinger. You're such a heretic. And I proved it with the scriptures. You don't want to sit there and go through all the scriptures because it's too much doctrine for you. It's, you know, over an hour sermon. Oh, please, I can't do that. And a two-parter in some of my studies that I do, oh, that's just too much scripture. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24, keep your hand right there. Go to Romans chapter 13, verse 9. We have to keep the Sabbath day. Oh, it's so important. We have to keep Shabbat. You have to start you know, trying to talk in Hebrew and whatever else. and It's just oh, it's so important to have the Sabbath day. We can't worship on Sunday because we'd be taking the mark of the beast. <laughs> okay, so the mark of the beast has been there since the first century. And again, I show in my study three different places. Once Jesus comes to them and meets with them on Sunday, the first day of the week, then two different places, uh, they're meeting on the first day of the week. So the early Christians and even Jesus himself showed up on the, or came and they were worshiping on the first day of the week, not on the Sabbath day, after Jesus rose from the dead. It's a problem, isn't it? But Matthew chapter 24, verse 20 says about um, neither on the Sabbath day. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 9. For this thou shalt, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's given the Ten Commandments here. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly commanded, uh, uh, comprehended in this saying, namely, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now here, <clears throat> I, we're not sure. This could be a copyist error, that a slip on the part of the pen of Paul that he just 
forgot to write the Sabbath day in there or uh, maybe copies of copies of copies of, or maybe you could just deal with the text and see that Christians don't worship on the Sabbath day. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay, there is no prescribed day in the New Testament that says Sunday morning from 9 till 12, you have to meet every week without fail, every time the doors are open. doesn't say that. Sabbath day, you, can, you have to keep the Sabbath day. You can't work on the Sabbath day. You know, you have to keep it holy. Uh, doesn't say that either. And ironically, I used to actually work with a Seventh-day Adventist when I was at the Strasburg Railroad when I was a teenager. And this guy was a filthy, fornicating, just terrible guy. And he would, he, I cannot work on the Sabbath day. And the guy was, you know, living with some girl and they're fornicating. And, and he was bragging the one time about how he was feeling sick. And he said he met with his girlfriend and they were fornicating. So oh, it took my headache away. Uh, we were drinking and, you know, smoking pot and whatever else. And uh, Sabbath keeping Seventh-day Adventist. So, you know, well, that's just one example. There's a lot of us that are a lot holier than that. Well, I would certainly hope so that your cult could produce something better than that. But the fact of the matter is, keeping the Sabbath day is not required for a Christian in the, in the New Testament. And if you do it, it doesn't make you some kind of super spiritual powerhouse. It's nonsense. And all these people that are coming out and they're saying, um, well, we have to say Yeshua and we have to keep the Sabbath day and all this other stuff. And we have to be Torah observant and all these other nonsensical things like that. Um, and there are certain parts of the Pauline epistles. Well, while we can respect the Apostle Paul, I follow Jesus. You know, I don't follow the Apostle Paul. Well, then you're not a Christian, okay? You're not a Christian. It's just that simple. You're not rightly dividing the word of truth, you see? <laughs> you're causing the Bible to contradict. Ephesians chapter 2. It's fun, isn't it? Ephesians chapter 2. So you're so cocky. You're so arrogant. What a, no, I'm, I'm knocking down false doctrine. Rebuke them sharply, the Bible tells me. Don't come along with good words and fair speech. Now I'll give you another one here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Are you saved by works? No. If you go on to read there, verse 10, it talks about, you know, we, for we are in his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, created in Christ Jesus. You become part of the body of Christ, in other words, unto good works. The good works come after you get saved. Good works before salvation are a waste of time, to be quite frank. Just understand that you're a rotten, miserable sinner and that you can't save yourself. Jesus died for sinners, get saved. Okay, then you can do good works. But if you want to do good works before that, well, then you're, like I said, wasting your time. But understand, how are you saved as a New Testament Christian? By grace are ye saved. Okay, stop there. Whose grace? Your grace? Do you have grace for God? No, God has grace for you, rotten sinner. God had grace for me as a rotten sinner. What's my part? Through faith. My faith in what is written in Scripture. I have faith that this book is telling me the truth. I have faith that there was a man named Jesus Christ that lived nearly 2,000 years ago. I have faith, you see. And I say nearly, I should say died on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago. Let me say it that way. He was alive 2,000 years ago. Okay? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's God's grace that saves and again, you get into that with non-dispensationalists. Well, we're saved the same way from Genesis to Revelation. You say, how's that? Through God's grace. Well, um, yes, that's true. God's grace has always been there. But there's a different mode of how you get to that grace. They didn't have faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection back in you know, the Garden of Eden. All right? uh, they didn't know about it. All right? They didn't have faith throughout the Old Testament in, in Jesus dying on the cross. And in the millennial kingdom that's coming in the future, they aren't going to have faith. God's grace is still there, but they aren't going to have faith because faith is the evidence of things not seen. They're going to be able to look over into Jerusalem and they're going to see Jesus Christ on his throne. There's no faith there. It's works, complete works. But let me show you here. 
keep keep your hand in Ephesians chapter 2 and go to James chapter 2. And here's a good one, another one. People get so messed up on this one. Oh boy, do they get messed up. Catholics will take you here and they'll get you all twisted around. Cunning craftiness, you know. And they'll say that uh, <clears throat> we have to do the sacraments. You say, well, that sounds like works. We have to go to penance and, or to confessional and we have to do penance and all this other stuff. That stuff sounds like works. Well, you have to die in a state of grace. Well, that sounds like works. It is. And they'll say, well, <clears throat> that's why we go to James chapter 2. You know, we kind of uh, interpret Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 through James chapter 2. That's how it works. James chapter 2, verse 17 through 20. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Uh, doesn't that contradict over what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? You're saved. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The time of your salvation is faith. They say faith alone. Well, that's not technically correct. The Bible doesn't say that. It's grace through faith. God's grace, man's faith. Very important to understand that. Sola fide is a lie. It's grace through faith. Watch out for the man-made stuff. The solas, the five solas and whatever. Eh, some truth there, but also some deception. But uh, getting back to the passage here. James chapter 2, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Uh, faith without works is dead? Well, no, it isn't. Um, you're supposed to do good works after you get saved, but you can be pretty much a lazy slob and not do anything for the Lord and just waste your life away and you get wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. But here it says that you have to have faith in works. So, isn't that a contradiction? Ephesians. Faith, not of works. James chapter 2. Uh, faith and works. What's going on there? Well, if you study it out, uh, without getting into a big study, because I've done it many times in the past, and you can just, I mean, watch all my videos. I talk about all this different stuff in my videos. I go through a lot of these things. It might not be the exact title and whatever, but my doctrinal stands, or my doctrinal studies, rather, uh, I get into some really deep doctrine. And I've had people, you know, seminary graduates, and they come and they say, Brother Brian, I've learned more underneath your ministry than I learned at seminary. I've learned more watching you than 30 years ago in the church someplace. No glory to me. It's just I want to bring the truth out. And I put it out there. I don't have a, a hidden agenda or something like that to make you part of my cult or something. I have no cult for you to join. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> that's just the way it is. But uh, what's really going on here, if you go to James chapter 1, we'll look about this real quick. James chapter 1. Uh, Verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Who is James addressing? He's addressing the twelve tribes. That's who he's addressing. To grab my notes, I just knocked them off the stand here. Why would James be addressing the twelve tribes when there's neither Jew nor Greek? We're all one in Christ Jesus. Let me show you that. Here, we'll go into that in just a minute or two. We'll finish with another, or go to another one here. Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Here's another uh, contradiction. And we'll get back to the thing of the Jews. And uh, in the body of Christ, what the doctrinal stand is there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. There's your salvation. Okay. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, unpack that verse right there. Okay. In whom ye also trusted, you trusted in Christ. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. How does your salvation come? By you just believing in something? Or 
It comes from the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So important. If you don't believe that this book is God's perfect word, what do you have? You have a, a belief that can be taken from you very easily by the men that are there, you know, the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, the slight of men. And, you know, I, I see people, I've been watching your videos, brother, but I saw this other guy and, and uh, he's making me doubt eternal security. And he's making me doubt that we're going to be raptured up, you know, the pre-trib rapture or more properly called the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, understand that. And he's making me doubt this and he's making me doubt that. Brethren, if you want to be saved, you have to spend some time in the word. You have to spend some time getting grounded with a man that actually believes the King James Bible, holds a King James Bible in his hands and encourages you to do the same. Look up the verses, get grounded in the scriptures, spend some time alone. Well, I just got saved and there's a church in my area. Uh, be careful. Most of those church buildings, there's no church buildings in the New Testament, but most of them are very corrupt. They're social clubs and they will mess you up badly. And you can go and experience it all you want to. I'm not going to keep people from going to church buildings somewhere. If you want to go, then go. But you're going to find out how corrupt those places are, especially nowadays. But it says there about the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you have to have a, the word of God, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. How can you lose it if you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? It doesn't say with your own belief. You're sealed with your own belief of promise. Or, no, the Holy Spirit seals you. Very important to understand that. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Again, I've preached on this passage so many times. This is so important to understand. This is dispensational theology right here. They weren't sealed in the past. They will not be sealed in the future. You have a very special promise right now. If you are saved, if you are born again, the Holy Spirit of promise has sealed you until the day of, of redemption. You're a purchased possession. So again, I've told this story many times. I'll tell it one more time. Many years ago, I won a motorcycle, my KLR 650 that I had at Kawasaki. I bought it on eBay at a dealership that was down near some relatives of mine that, I, that, were, that had moved down to West Virginia. And I bought it. I paid for it without ever being there in person. And they took a tag and they put my name on it and they put that on that bike in their showroom. Sold. For how long? Till somebody came along and said, uh, hey, I'd like to have that bike there. I, I really kind of like that. I've been want, wanting one just like that. You know what? I'd like to buy that. Doesn't matter. It's sold until the day of redemption. Mr. Denlinger is going to come down and he's going to pick up this motorcycle. He's making some arrangements. And uh, when he comes to pick up that motorcycle, he's taking it with him. And nobody's going to pluck that motorcycle out of his hand. You see. You understand? When the Lord saves you, he seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. He puts his tag on you and he says, My purchased possession, that man, that woman, they belong to me. And nobody's going to take them from me. I own them. So you see, eternal security, all false prophets, all these, the slight of men, they come along and they say, well, what if you do this sin? What if you do that sin? And they make your security for your salvation about you and about your righteousness. It's not about me. It's not about my righteousness. It's about what God has done for me. He's purchased me. He's sealed me with his Holy Spirit of promise. And I don't have to worry about losing it because it's not mine to lose. You understand? Well, let's uh, keep your hand there in Ephesians chapter 1. But I can write in the comments here, I have one that can disprove it. So do I. And that's where we're going. Hebrews chapter 10. And I mean, I've dealt with people in person on this whole thing at church buildings. I've dealt with people for years with all of this stuff. I know how the game is played. Hebrews chapter 10, you say, oh, well, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What about Hebrews 10, 26, and 27? Huh? See? Let's look at it. 
For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Remember I was dealing with this charismatic the one time at a Baptist church and we're down there and a senior pastor's there and I'm there and this guy's friend and him, they were sitting there and, and he says, turns in his Bible and he says, right there. And I said, can I ask you a question? And he turns to me, he said, yes, certainly. And I said, have you ever sinned after you got saved? He said, well, yeah, of course. He said, you know, I, I've sinned. And I said, sinned willfully? And he said, yeah. And I said, did you lose your salvation? He said, yes, I did. I said, did you get it back? And he said, well, of course I got it back. I'm saved. I'm a saved man. You just have to confess your sins and you have to go before him. You, you renew your, you know, obedience and whatever else to him. And, and you kind of get back. And I said, it doesn't say that in the text. It says, um, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. He said, yeah, but what it's, what it's saying is that the sin, that, that Jesus, when he died, the sacrifice for sins, that that's always enough that's there, you know, every time that you need to be resaved. <laughs> I said, it's not what it says. Because if you mess up one time willful sin, it says that there, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indign indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He said, well, that's if you don't confess. I said, you know, and get back right. And I, where's that in the, at in the text? And by the way, I said, uh, can I ask you another question? Are you a Hebrew? Blonde haired, blue eyed guy there. And he said, uh, no. And I said, uh, uh, the book is written to the Hebrews. Well, you know, but I think that the other point, just boom, away they go. Yeah, you'll find that with these uh, cunning craftiness of these false prophets, these liars. They, uh, they're they very quick to try to change the subject when they get cornered. You say, but I don't understand. We're going to get to it. Galatians chapter 3, one more place to go to. Another contradiction. And again, if, if you are non-dispensational, I am proudly non-dispensational. You have no real explanation for this. You have to change the text and you have to move things around. And well, what's really trying to be said, you can't just take the text for what it says. And a lot of these, you can mix, mess them around a little bit, but you can't really duck it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm a Christian. Oh, well, we have Jewish Christians and we have Gentile Christians. No, we have Christians, members of the body of Christ. I'm part of the church, the body of, you know, the Lord there. That's just the way it is. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, uh, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. Now, obviously, there's differences there. Um, obviously, you know, my wife and I look different, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, in terms of, uh, she's not actually a Christian. She's a female, um, say, no, she's a Christian. You see? Well, then that's true. That's, that's the whole way from Genesis to Revelation. They were always Christians. Neither bond, neither uh, Jew nor Greek. Right? No. Keep your hand there in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, and go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4 it says here, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of the Christians. No. Children of Israel. But I thought there's neither Jew nor, nor Greek. Go down to verse 9 in the same chapter, Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Um, so then, wait a second. We have, in Revelation chapter 7, we have difference being made between Jews and Gentiles. But back in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Isn't that a contradiction? Yeah, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
And every heretical group out there will try to get you away from this very simple concept in Scripture. They'll try to say that uh, dispensationalism is heresy, it's terrible, it's this, it's that, it's whatever. Um, I will tell you right now, brethren, if you are not a dispensationalist, if you can't understand dispensationalism, um, I have major questions. I mean, if you're newly saved, okay, I won't judge you harshly, but if somebody says I've been saved for years and I am non-dispensational, they're lost. I have to just say that. Unless they have been really in the wrong circles and they have not heard the truth. But I mean, I've, I've seen guys that uh, Baptists, you know, King James only type of Baptists, and you say dispensational, and they'll just, they just get angry. I'm not dispensational. It's heresy. It's just, uh, you know, the Bible the teaches the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. In the Old Testament, they look forward to the cross, and now we look backward toward the cross. Uh, could you please give me a book, chapter, and verse in that one, please? Uh, well, they can't. But uh, weird. But just to show you the title of this old sermon that I did many years ago, it's called Non-Dispensational Christian Contradictions. Right there it is. Preached that thing the whole way back in 2009. I know this thing's probably worth a lot of money right now because it's a, it's vintage sermon notes from me or something. Little joke there. Uh, no, it's just paper. But uh, if you're non-dispensational, you will make the scriptures contradict. And that's what these people will do. That's what false prophets, all of them do. Um, every postie that I've ever run into, they must use Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke chapter 17, and Luke chapter 21. Every single postie has to go there. They can't avoid it. Now, if you would corner them, they might say, well, I can kind of prove it with, you know, over here and whatever. But if you just let them go and let them spew their heresy at you, they will go to Matthew chapter 24 most of the time. Sometimes if they're a little bit deeper in their studies, they'll go to Mark 13 or Luke 17 or 21. But for the most part, Matthew chapter 24. Every single time, the rapture is a pre-trib rapture is a lie. It's exposed, pre-trib fib exposed. You know, you see this type of thing. And I can click on it and I just say, watch, Matthew chapter 24, watch them. Let's turn in your Bible first to Matthew chapter 24. They all do it. Um... You know, we're supposed to keep the law. We're supposed to be Torah observant. And you can, you know, this damnable lie of once saved, always saved. And eternal security. It's, it's a terrible lie. Let me show you. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6, I think it is. Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, you're not a Hebrew. Why are you turning there? Oh, well, what a heresy. So you're saying we should ignore certain parts of the New Testament? We should ignore certain parts of the Bible? No, you should rightly divide it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, one of the most shameful things that you will experience as a Christian is when you get deceived and you go into some stupid, idiotic cult for years and you're just in there and you're getting messed up and you're going deeper and deeper into heresy. And it doesn't take long now, brethren, especially with the speed of the internet. I mean, it's light speed now. I mean, people just get saved. They see my salvation message and they go, oh, wow. You know, they pray, you know, Lord, please save me. I believe that your word says, you know, Jesus died for my sins. I can't even fathom that. And, and they get saved, you know, died, was buried, he rose again and shed his blood to pay for my sins. And wow, Lord, please save me. Lord saves them and, and they go, oh man, praise the Lord. I, such a amazing thing that what what's this thing here oh the, okay uh, that looks like an interesting thing you know what jesus said about you know our keeping his commandments and they give you the scripture you look it up you say well, let me get a king james bible here and you look it up and oh yeah jesus said to keep his commandments huh i didn't know we had to keep the commandments and the video goes on to say see jesus set up something that the apostle paul went against See, the Apostle Paul was actually, a lot of the other disciples were against him and, and whatever. And you go, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and the slight of men, they got you. They caught you. Cunning craftiness. And what they'll do is they'll go, they'll jump over to something else that's not written for you as a Christian, some other thing. And they say, hey, it's New Testament. Look at that, the book of Hebrews. Friend, you have to endure to the end. The, book of, the Bible says it. Jesus said that you have to endure to the end, Matthew chapter 24. All oh, the times that are coming. 
all the, the horrors that are coming to this world. When the first seal is open and the Antichrist is unleashed. And we have to go through this, brethren, we have to endure to the end. Don't believe the false prophets out there that tell you that you're going to be caught up and the Lord's going to spare you. There's no third coming. It's only two comings. <laughs> and they do all this stuff and you're going, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> and you get sidetracked. The devil knocks you off course. Then you come and you listen to me for a little while and you go, oh, well, okay, yeah, all right, he straightened me out on that. Oh, wow, praise the Lord. I'm, I'm not actually going to have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Whew, okay, yeah, I can see that. Doctrinally proved that. What is this guy saying over here in this other video? Oh, the King James Bible has errors in it? Well, they're not really errors. It's just it could be translated a little bit better. Oh, okay, well, I guess I should probably get a, a Textus Receptus. Yeah, that... That sounds, he said Texas Receptus. I think he said Texas Receptus. Yeah. Okay. Well, here we have the Holy Scriptures in the original languages by the Trinitarian Bible Society. Yeah. The Hebrew there. And then you have the Greek over here, you know, and you go, okay. All right. All right. Well, you know, uh, okay. Uh, well, that's, that's a lot easier to read than the, than the text of the King James Bible, you know, because the text of the King James Bible is archaic, you know, it's hard to understand, but you know, how do you read this thing again? Um, well, okay, I, that's giving me a headache. I think I'll go here to the Greek. Yeah, you know, talk about that's all Greek to me. You know, there you go. Now well, that's that's where you can really be straightened out doctrinally and everything else. Uh, no, you can use the Bible that's superior to all of this stuff right here. All right, uh, the most printed book, published book in the history of the world. Not my opinion. Not my narrow-minded uh, thing. It's truth. No other book has been printed as much as this King James Bible. Including the original languages. But, you know, some false prophet coming along gets you in that. And they'll, they'll get you sidetracked and they'll say, well, actually, the Texas Receptus would be better with, uh, you know, this is the majority text, see? The Greek New Testament, according to the majority text, you want to be in the majority, don't you? So you have the majority text right there, you see? This one is the one you want. Hodges and Farstad, see? This is the one here. This 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 will get you here good. And, and this has the critical apparatus down here. You say, I thought the critical apparatus is in a car. <laughs> There's a bunch of critical apparatuses in a car. Little joke there. But um, this down here tells you where the different manuscript, you know, things it's in papyrus fragment you know this and that and it's in uh this manuscript and that manuscript and it's in you know b and l f and all this you know what this one does is they combine receptus with you know alexander alexandrian type of things and then if they can get you far enough then they say okay well the the most accurate most most up to date is this one here the nestle's 28th edition see that's the real important one here this is the one that's the best, most accurate, oldest and best manuscripts. This is one used by the Catholic Church, but we won't talk about that. You see? Cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Well, aren't we supposed to read the Greek and the Hebrew? Why? I mean, do we have to reinvent the wheel? Don't we have a perfect translation in English? One that if you just read this book, it'll lead you into all truth. Well, I've I've listened to certain men. Yeah, they're they're cunning. They have craftiness. They're lying in wait to deceive. <laughs> you see? I mean, it's just I don't know how else to say this. If you think that these things are actual real contradictions, well, then you have some problems. Uh, you need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And again, it's not that, oh, well, we just ignore whole portions of the scriptures. It's only the Pauline epistles, and that's all that's there. You can compare scripture with scripture. I get some of my greatest blessings from the Old Testament under the law. Some of the greatest instruction in righteousness and things like that. Absolutely. Go back to the Old Testament. Um, but stick with the Pauline epistles. And Paul writes about, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. You're supposed to read the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, but understand the context. Who is he speaking to? What's going on in that context? You say, well, brother, this, this sounds really complicated. 
That's why the Bible says to study. Okay, um, if you're looking for five-minute Christianity, I, I think I have some time here. Tell, what do I have to do to get saved? And, and then tell me what I need to, what's the doctrinal stuff? Get, give it to me in a five-minute video. Uh, time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's going to take you years to study and truly understand what Bible-believing Christianity really is. And I have done my very best over the years to try and make all of these doctrinal things, all of the studies that I have done over the years, all the manuscript evidence and, uh, you know, commentary type of stuff up here. And, I mean, all the different, you know, studying about cults and the occult and uh, fake evangelists and Freemasonry and, and Roman Catholicism. I have a whole road of it down there and down there as well. And, you know, all of these different things. I've tried to take that and condense it and to make it into videos to explain the Bible to you. And, you know, I've done over 2,000 videos over the years, uh, since going back to 2007, and uh, just done a massive amount of work because I'm trying to get the answers to you out there. And I try to answer these little sleight of hand little tricks that these guys do with doctrine. And I'll tell you right now, their favorite tactic, the favorite tactic of all false prophets is to get you into the wrong dispensation. Because if they can do that, then they can get you in all kinds of other heresy. And you see Galatians, the book of Galatians, and these Jews are trying to get the Gentiles back under the law and saying you have to keep the Ten Commandments. And, and uh, Peter, in the book of Acts, you know, he says, you know, we couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. What are you trying to make them keep it for? <laughs> you know, it's very true. But you see, that's what they'll do. They'll get you trying to take doctrinal things out of the book of Hebrews, trying to apply it to your eternal security. They'll say you're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble because Matthew chapter 24, there's no second or, or third coming or something. There's no mysterious rapture there and whatever in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. He's talking about the catching up of the body of Christ. It's not been revealed yet. Openly as a doctrine. See? You have to understand this stuff. It takes a long time. But if you don't say, if you say, I'm not going to rightly divide the word of truth, then you'll fall for anything. And these people will convince you, especially with the power of, of video. I mean, I most of my videos, I'm standing somewhere or walking with a camera or standing here like this. I'm not going to barrage you with music and graphics and all kinds of animation and whatever else. I use some of it sparingly but I'm not going to try to control your mind and shape you into thinking certain things like the cunning craftiness and the slight of men, these deceivers that are lying there and trying to catch you and ensnare you. They're servants of the devil. So um, please do take heed, okay? If you don't listen to me, you are going to get caught. Oh, you think Denlinger thinks he's the only one that's right. Whatever. I can't help you. If you just want to, you know, old Denlinger's just some YouTube dude with a camera and whatever, and he's in this for the money, and he's actually a high-level witchcraft, you know, whatever the lies are about me, you know. Uh, he's a nut. He doesn't want to go out. He's a hermit that lives, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and yeah, whatever. Okay? But if you want to go past all of that stuff and say, okay, what are the fruits of this man? Can I learn from this guy? I'm going to spend some time. I'm not going to listen to all the naysayers out there. I want to hear what Brian Denlinger has to say. I'm going to follow along in my King James Bible because he's one of the few that tells me to do it. He's one of the few that encourages me to get a King James Bible and follow along. I don't stand there and just put the scriptures up on the screen and, and whatever else. And I've seen these guys, they'll make documentaries. They will change the text of the King James Bible with what they put up on the screen. And unless you're sitting there following along in your King James Bible, you won't even notice it. You won't even notice it. Uh, these uh, nut new IFB devils, they came out with a documentary years ago that they did on uh, the, I forget what it was called, something about um, this disaster of dispensationalism or some kind of thing like that, some kind of nonsense. They had me in there for all of a few seconds. And uh, they put Gene Kim and Robert Breaker, which those guys are total goofballs. They're fakes. But uh, they put them in there because they mess up the dispensational teaching. They mess up the gospel. They mess up all kinds of stuff. So, of course, they're going to feature them in their video on dispensationalism. And then they put some clips from Ruckman in there where they took him out of context. And they put, like I said, a, maybe five seconds of me 
in the one thing with my big study I did on dispensationalism, which I can link to at the end. It's on my secondary channel. But, uh, you know, it was just a hit piece. It was the whole thing. And there was a portion of that video where they actually misquoted the scripture to try to prove their point. And unless, unless you were following along in your King James Bible, you would have never picked up on it. Um, dispensation of heresy is what it was called. And, you know, I'm one of the heretics that they supposedly, um, you know, exposed or something like this. Denlinger's a heretic and C.I. Schofield and, and Peter Ruckman and whatever else. Um, listen to what I have to say. Watch my videos. Spend some time studying. Um, it's not going to hurt you. Okay, it doesn't cost you anything. Again, you know, you watch 500 videos of mine or something like that, you aren't going to get a a bill in the mail saying, you know, we have, I've seen that you've watched 500 my, of my videos. Now you need to pay up or something. They're free. They're free. Um, and again, what are people donating to this ministry for? Let me just cover that. Uh, you cover, you, you donate to this ministry because you see the amount of work that I've put into it. You say, I appreciate your work. You're not trying to come and join this ministry and say, I want to police what you spend your money on and whatever else the laborer is worthy of, of his hire. Look at what I've put out. If you're blessed by it, and the Lord says, okay, go donate to the guy. Then do it. If you don't want to, then don't. you don't have to. It's simple. But I mean, you will get more than a seminary education on this channel. I will bring up things and I will teach you things that nobody at these seminaries will even mention. They will not talk about it. You, oh, I, I just don't know. Try it out. Try it out. Watch the videos. Watch my doctrinal videos that I've put out. There's hundreds of them on this channel and on other channels and things too that are that are mirrored a lot of my videos. Hundreds of videos that you can watch for free. You can get a, a uh, I don't have one in here right now, but you can get a, a software program. You can download these videos, convert it to an MP3 file. And while you're doing your, your kitchen work or your housework or you're driving your truck someplace, you know, uh, truck delivery guy or something, or you're doing your job or whatever else, I remember hearing a guy the one time years ago, James Melton, and he said he would listen to Peter Ruckman on his, on his you know, headphones while he was a janitor at Walmart as a young man. And he said, I had my uh, Walmart Bible University. You know, he learned all the scriptures and things from listening to Peter Ruckman. I did similar things like that. Listen, study, study, and test it out. Try it out. Okay? But uh, you hear some guy, I'll just give you a little bit of advice. And you can, if you want to go, you know, learn the hard way, you can do that. You can go be deceived by these people. Let them pull you away with the sleight of hand little tricks that they do. If you want to do that and go waste your time in some cult someplace, going back to the Old Testament, going to new versions, uh, whatever. These different cults that are out there. If you want to do that, then go ahead, get the experience, you know, firsthand experience. I was deceived by such and such cult. Or you can listen to a man that's 48 years old. That has been dealing with organized religion all of his life dedicated as a little baby up in front of the church building i've been in churches i've been in churches in other countries i've been in churches in other states i've been through just about every type of church that there is and you can listen to my advice as a very experienced veteran preacher and you can come along and you can say okay what do you have to say to me brother brian very simple if you ever see a preacher of any kind and he does not rightly divide the word of truth Scrap him and get away from him quickly. I'll tell you that. Every non-dispensational preacher out there, pastor, whatever, guy that does videos on YouTube, every single one of them is messed up. Across the board. If I could tell you one group to avoid, it's non-dispensational Christians. Non-dispensational people, they will mess you up badly. And they'll get into all this stuff of, well, John Nelson Darby and, well, you know, C.I. Schofield, well, 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 you know, and they'll, they'll mess you up bad. So, uh, and I'm not saying that C.I. Schofield was a, you know, some kind of angel or something like that. There was issues with the guy. There was issues with Clarence Lark and there was issues with Peter Ruckman and there are issues with me, right? But rightly dividing the word of truth is going to get you to the truth of the scriptures, you're commanded to rightly divide the word of truth. So, uh, very passionate about that whole thing, brethren. It's extremely important that you understand it. But uh, that is going to be it. I have working on my overhead camera 
set up here where I have to set it up. I have to put a table here and everything else. Um, my camera that I have is really getting old. It's probably, I'd say 15 years old that I do the overhead camera shots with. I'm not even sure if it works anymore. I have to charge the battery and get a bunch of stuff done on that. So that's, there's a little bit of a delay on the hymn book right here. Still won't show the title. Some of you've already figured it out what, you know, what it is, but this is the hymn book really good. And, uh, this is the, this is the hard bound and this is the leather bound. You can see it has some nice ribbon markers in it and everything else. Uh, really incredible. I will be doing the, uh, review of that tabletop review. But like I said, I have to set up everything. I have this aluminum bar up here that I put the camera on and it, and then it goes down and I have a monitor up on top of my bookshelf. You might've seen it in the live stream. Um, and I have all the things that plug into it. I have lights and all that to help light up the table. And then I can show the text and everything and the actual quality of it and whatever else I can show that. Um, so I have to get around to doing that, get the camera, figure out if it even still works been so long since I've done one um, but we'll see so I guess that will be it we'll see you in the next video and uh, thank you to all out there for your support thank you for your prayers and um, get out there and study the Word of God